By July of 2021, Venezuelan woman Carla Diaz Torrealba, also known as La Pelua or The Hair, had become one of the most trusted enforcers of Carlos Luis El Cocay Revete, who controlled a significant portion of Caracas. He had risen to power in 2017 when President Nicolás Maduro, whom multiple international media outlets described as a dictator, was reported to have made deals with local gang bosses. They were meant to crack down on petty crime, but some, like Kokai, seized the opportunity, recruited more soldiers, and reigned freely as warlords over various areas of the capital. As reported by law enforcement, Torrealba was a guardian or lookout in Kokai's organization. The 22-year-old mother of one whose social media photos showed some instances of her scantily clad while posing with assault rifles, was reported to have been involved in a number of other criminal operations with the gang. She most notably acted as bait in honey trap schemes through which she seduced the gang's rivals before they were kidnapped or ambushed. In July of 2021, the authorities decided to make a move on Kokai's empire in an operation that saw hundreds of special forces officers move into the Kota 905 district. A massive shootout ensued that spilled into the motorway at the center of the city. The Monitor de Victamas, a Venezuelan independent journalism initiative, reported that at least 33 bodies were counted in the gun battle's aftermath, with some of the dead being alleged victims of extrajudicial executions by the police. Torrealba was among those arrested during the raid, although her degree of involvement in the shootout remained unspecified. El Cocay, who'd been wanted for months with a $500,000 reward to his name, reportedly escaped but updates indicated he was ultimately gunned down in a subsequent police raid that took place in February of 2022. Number 6. Wayne Bryan On June the 14th of 2008, Englishman Wayne Bryan, aged 20, was invited to a party at a home in Manchester where teenager Sophie Finucane was also in attendance at some point during the night. Brian, who'd been drinking and smoking cannabis, started dancing around while holding a pistol in his hand. In the moments that followed, the gun went off and a round hit Finna Kane in the head at close range. She was rushed to a hospital where doctors gave her less than an hour to live due to bullet fragments that had become lodged in her brain. However, after spending 10 days in the intensive care unit, the teenager regained consciousness Updates from October of 2008 indicated that Finna Kane was unable to walk and had lost the use of her right arm while also suffering from seizures and damaged vision. Some of the bullet fragments were impossible to remove, and doctors deemed it highly unlikely that the team would ever fully recover. Brian fled in the shooting's immediate aftermath and got rid of the gun before he surrendered to local law enforcement about an hour later. He claimed to have found the weapon in a bag during the party and described feeling good with it in his hand. Photos from Brian's cell phone showed him and a friend posing with handguns with one photo captioned with the words West Gorton Crew, a Manchester street gang with which he reportedly associated. Brian had a long criminal record and just three days before the shooting, the police raided his home and found a magazine containing seven bullets. The man was released on bail shortly thereafter. Andy Tattersall, a senior investigating officer for Greater Manchester Police, described Brian as a young man fascinated with gun and gang culture, also branding him a coward for being more preoccupied with getting rid of the weapon instead of helping Finna Kane. The handgun was never found, and Tattersall emphasized that its presence on the street meant that someone else was at risk of being shot. Brian admitted reckless wounding, possession of a firearm, possession of an imitation firearm, and two counts of possession of ammunition at Manchester Crown Court in mid-fall 2008. He was jailed for eight years. Number 5. Street Feud in Queens in the spring of 2023, New York prosecutors unsealed a 151-count indictment against 33 rival gang members involved in a bloody war on the streets of Queens, which had led to the death of at least two innocent bystanders and half a dozen others being injured. 
At the center of the territorial feud was the Money World Gang and two other Queen's crews, local trap stars, and never forget loyalty. The war ignited after an incident in mid-April of 2019, when a member from the former gang was slashed and beaten by rivals. On October the 26th, Money World associate Sean Brown spotted teenager Amir Griffin playing basketball on a court in South Jamaica. Brown mistook Griffin, who was reported as a promising athlete, for a rival gang member and fatally shot him three times with a 380 caliber pistol. Brown wouldn't be arrested until 2021. The shooting was followed by several retaliatory attacks. One of them occurred on New Year's Eve 2020, when Sean Vance, aged 26, was gunned down while in the driver's seat of a parked BMW on Sutfin Boulevard. The shooting was planned by four Money World gang members, and the gunman was identified as Timurth Bay Foster. He was charged with second-degree murder, and his accomplices, Joel Lewis, Jokai Coy, and Justin Harvey, were charged as co-conspirators in the slaying. The common charge amongst all the 33 gang members named in the indictment was conspiracy to commit murder, but a plethora of other charges were noted in the lengthy document. As of subsequent updates on the matter, eight of the gang members had already been jailed on other charges, while over a dozen others were arraigned. Number 4. MS-13 Incident in Maryland in early May of 2023, Rosa Sanchez Marino, aged 18, was brutally murdered in a wooded area of Olney in Maryland. The body would remain undiscovered for several months. In late September of 2023, a man by the name of Roberto Carlos Rivera Delgado was arrested in Nevada for violating his parole, and he was extradited to Maryland. 23-year-old Rivera Delgado spoke to detectives and revealed the circumstances of Marino's murder, leading the authorities to the spot where she was buried in a shallow grave along Brookville Road. An autopsy was carried out in early October, which confirmed that the teenager's death had been a homicide via sharp trauma to the neck. Rivera Delgado named his accomplices as Iris Udella Alonso Salgado and Abaca Melga aged 23 and 21 respectively. A fourth killer was a male teenager whose identity wasn't revealed. They were all tracked down and arrested on charges of first-degree murder, with the teenager being charged as an adult. Rivera Delgado revealed that he'd driven the car which took Marino and the group to Brookville Road, where they got out and led the teen into the woods. Marino was forced to get on her knees before Rivera Delgado and the others took turns striking her in the neck with a machete. When she was no longer moving, they buried her in the shallow grave. A motive for the killing wasn't specified, but Rivera Delgado claimed that he and the others were members of the infamous Mara Salvatrucha gang better known as MS-13. The gang was notorious for using acts of extreme violence as a way of enforcing its reputation. Rivera Delgado noted that the teen's murder hadn't been sanctioned on MS-13's hierarchy chain, and the authorities suspected he'd chosen to confess in exchange for official protection as he was no longer in good standing with the gang. Number 3. Richard Magnan in December of 2014, Chicago gang member Richard Magnan, aged 35, was sentenced to 11 years in prison after pleading guilty to being an armed, habitual criminal and involuntary manslaughter. The case attracted media attention partly due to the man's unusual face tattoos, which included the logo of the Chicago White Sox, the STL logo for the St. Louis Cardinals, the word gangster below his nose, and the words F the world. In the summer of 2014, Magnan, a reported associate of the 2-6 gang, was at a 4th of July party along with fellow gang member 30-year-old Joel Bentley. They then left, accompanied by a third friend, and walked to the parking lot of a Walgreens in the 6200 block of South Austin Avenue. 
It was there that Magnan grabbed a gun from his truck and started waving it around while showing it to his friends. The others reportedly told him to put it away, but Magnan refused. He then accidentally pulled the trigger, striking Bentley in the abdomen. He died hours later at Advocate Christ Medical Center in Oak Lawn. Magnan fled the scene in the immediate aftermath, but was ultimately arrested at a Willow Brook Hotel. He reportedly confessed to shooting his friend in the wake of his arrest. Today's topic was requested by Timmy D, ZF2NB, and Eric Jones, ER8EN. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. OED Gang Incident in NYC 66-year-old Egyptian man, Reda Gurgis, was three days into visiting his son and pregnant daughter-in-law in Upper Manhattan, New York City. On May the 23rd of 2023, he was on the phone while outside the Chop Cheese Deli 2 in Washington Heights when a gray SUV pulled up on the street. Gunfire erupted from the vehicle and Gurgis was fatally shot in the head. CCTV captured the victim standing next to his daughter-in-law and then dropping to the sidewalk. Crime scene photos would show him in a pool of blood while bystanders looked on. His daughter-in-law was reported to have given birth the day after witnessing Gerges' death. 19-year-old Kelvin Sanchez, along with John Adele Lacard and Raheem Steed, both in their early 20s, were arrested on murder, assault, and criminal possession of a weapon charges in the incident's wake. It would emerge that they were part of the Trinitarios gang, OED, and Gerges had fallen victim to an errand shot meant for one of the gang's rivals. Gerges was survived by four children, two of whom lived in New York City and the others in Egypt. Stick around after number one in case you missed our release on seven people who should have never been released. That's coming right up. Number one, Anthony Garcia. 23-year-old California man, John Juarez, was shot dead on January the 23rd of 2004 outside Mr. Ed's liquor store in Pico Rivera, and his murder went unsolved for four years. In 2008, a man by the name of Anthony Garcia was arrested for driving with a suspended license. The authorities suspected he was a member of the Rivera 13 gang, and in addition to his mugshot, they took photos of his tattoos. In 2008, Detective Sergeant Kevin Lloyd of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office was searching for information on an unrelated case when he stumbled upon a photo of Garcia's tattooed chest, which consisted of a shooting scene sketch. It reminded Lloyd of a murder from way back when. Lloyd had worked as a sergeant at the Pico Rivera Sheriff's Station back in 2004 when Juarez was fatally shot. The sketch inked on Garcia's chest was under another tattoo that read, Rivera kills. It depicted a battle helicopter shooting at a Mr. Peanut figure. Garcia's gang nickname was Chopper, and Peanut was often insultingly used as the symbol of a rival gang member in Pico Rivera. It ultimately emerged that Garcia's tattoo represented the night he'd gunned down Juarez in vivid detail. The sketch showed the liquor storefront, complete with its name and the Christmas lights that were on at the time. The distinctive bowed street lamp across the way and the street sign in its vicinity. The tattoo even showed the trajectory of the bullet in the direction in which the body of the victim had fallen. Garcia was arrested for Juarez's first degree murder in October of 2008 and reportedly confessed to undercover officers posing as gang members in jail. When asked by them what the tattoo meant, Garcia responded that it depicted his first slaying. Additionally, his getaway driver from the night pleaded guilty to his involvement and testified against Garcia. Deputy District Attorney Brock Lunsford, prosecuting, would describe the ink as a non-verbal confession and noted that Garcia's arrogance got the better of him. He'd steadily added to the tattoo, as reflected by photos of his torso taken after he'd been picked up for various offenses since the murder. A 2005 booking photo showed only the chopper and peanut figure, while one from 2006 showed the added liquor store front prior to the full scene exhibited in 2008. Detective Lloyd was lauded for his incredible observation and stated that in his three-decade-long career, he'd never seen a tattoo that depicted an entire murder scene. In the spring 
of 2011. Garcia, who was at the time in his mid-twenties, was sentenced to 65 years to life in prison. Number seven, James Worley. 20-year-old Sierra Joffin was riding her bicycle near County Road 6 in Metamora, Ohio. After departing from her boyfriend's house on the evening of July the 19th of 2016, when the young woman never returned home, her family contacted the authorities to report her missing. Later that night, the Fulton County Sheriff's Office came upon Joffin's bicycle several rows into a cornfield near where she'd last been seen. Investigators noted that there were signs of some sort of struggle near the crime scene, as well as motorcycle tracks in the crops. Several other items, including a pair of sunglasses, a screwdriver, and a box of automotive fuses were also found near the bicycle. While canvassing the nearby area, officers encountered a man by the name of James Worley, who indicated that his motorcycle had broken down in the area of the crime scene and that he'd lost items of the same description as those that had been recovered. The man, who'd been sentenced to prison time back in 1990 for assaulting and attempting to kidnap a female victim, was officially classified as a person of interest after a witness claimed to have seen his passenger van speed through the area on the night of Joe Finn's disappearance. Investigators conducted a search of Worley's property, whereupon they discovered a hidden room in his barn that contained multiple pairs of women's underwear, restraints, and a freezer stained with blood. Jofin's DNA was recovered from a strip of duct tape and an inflatable mattress that had also been found in the barn. Worley was arrested three days after the young woman had gone missing. That same day, Jofin's remains were discovered in a shallow grave, located a few miles from Worley's property. Following the case's ensuing legal proceedings, the man was convicted of murder, kidnapping, assault, and other related charges and was consequently sentenced to death. Despite his previous violent conviction, Worley reportedly hadn't been listed on any state or federal offender database prior to committing his latest offense. His property was awarded to the victim's family, who had the barn where she met her tragic demise demolished. As of the latest updates on the matter, Worley's execution was scheduled to take place on May the 20th of 2025. Number six. Jimmy David Mills. On September the 17th of 2020, Atlanta man Jimmy David Mills entered a stranger's home in the 1600 block of North Druid Hills Road and confronted a woman inside as she showered. The woman's husband confronted the intruder, who then pulled out a knife and stabbed the man in the face and stomach before fleeing the scene. Police were alerted to the situation and began searching the area for Mills. A witness reported seeing him jump over a wall on Lennox Park Boulevard, where officers later came upon him as he walked out from behind another house. He was arrested and charged with aggravated assault, home invasion, criminal attempt to commit burglary, and possession of a knife during the commission of a crime. It subsequently emerged that Mills had previously been busted for another violent home invasion back in 2015, when he'd allegedly broken into a condominium and assaulted a pair of women. After pleading guilty to burglary, two counts of aggravated assault and possession of a knife during a crime, Mills spent the next five years behind bars before being paroled only a month before offending again. Number five, Sebastian J. Snyder. In September of 2016, the police in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, received a call about a violent early morning home invasion in the 400 block of Wadley Street. When officers arrived at the scene, the homeowner reported having been awoken by the sound of someone banging on the windows. He eventually determined the visitor to be his girlfriend's son named as Sebastian J. Snyder. The latter continued making a racket until his mother's boyfriend answered the door at which point he forced his way inside and began attacking the man. The victim fell to the ground, but Snyder continued his vicious assault, allegedly choking him with his elbows at one point. Snyder eventually went to his bedroom in the family home and retrieved his belongings before leaving the scene. The police later indicated that the incident wasn't the first time the 25-year-old had become violent with his mother and those close to her. In connection to his latest outburst, Snyder was charged with substantial battery, domestic abuse, strangulation and disorderly conduct. At the time, 
He also had an open case against him in Fond du Lac County for domestic abuse and was previously convicted on separate counts of felony battery in both Fond du Lac and Portage counties. For his various domestic violence offenses, Snyder faced the possibility of spending more than a decade behind bars. Number four, Terrell Rollins. On April the 23rd of 2020, repeat offender Terrell Rollins was pulled over by deputies of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office in Florida for having an excessively dark tint on his windows. Rather than comply with law enforcement, the 27-year-old fled the traffic stop, leading to a high-speed chase through the streets of Plant City. Officers eventually abandoned their pursuit due to Rollins's erratic driving. Per official reports on the matter, the man reached speeds of up to 93 miles per hour while traveling through the neighborhood near Maryland Avenue and Warren Street. He then ran a stop sign and plowed directly into a vehicle being operated by 53-year-old Amanda Renee Holmes Williams, a local grandmother. Rollins fled the scene of the crash on foot without rendering aid to the innocent victim, who was killed instantaneously. A short time later, Plant City Police tracked him down to the backyard of a nearby house and placed him under arrest. He was charged with third-degree murder, fleeing and attempting to elude a police officer, vehicular homicide, leaving the scene of a crash with death and driving with a license that was cancelled, suspended or revoked. Rollins, who'd previously spent more than three years in prison for aggravated battery, was convicted of each count and sentenced to another 30 years behind bars. Number 3. Adarian Morris a Tennessee man with a lengthy rap sheet dating back many years was convicted of aggravated assault and domestic violence in February of 2016. Despite the severity of 29-year-old Adarian Morris's alleged crimes and his status as a repeat violent offender, he only received a two-year suspended jail sentence, largely due to his accusers' unwillingness to cooperate with the prosecution or testify against him in court. The month after his sentence was handed down, Morris was involved in a violent altercation with his girlfriend in which he struck her with a glass bottle inside a Brick Church Pike motel room, causing swelling to her head, arms and hands. A warrant was issued for his arrest, but he wasn't taken into custody. On April the 5th of 2016, the man assaulted a different woman he was dating, inflicting a severe laceration to her face with a coffee mug and consequently being issued a second arrest warrant. One week later, Morris allegedly carried out an armed robbery of two acquaintances at their Nashville residence, holding them hostage for 45 minutes before finally leaving. The serial reoffender was subsequently involved in two additional incidents that led to him facing more criminal charges. One in which he tossed chemicals on a woman's face and another in which he drove head-on into traffic while eluding police. Then on May the 19th, Morris entered his girlfriend's 25th Avenue North home while she slept. He proceeded to unleash a brutal attack on her, striking and choking her in her bed. In all, Morris had reportedly accumulated 20 active warrants for his arrest before he was finally taken into police custody. Following his latest domestic violence incident, he faced a myriad of charges including aggravated kidnapping and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Court documents indicated that he was subsequently ordered to serve six years in a community corrections placement after pleading guilty. Less than two months later, however, after Morris allegedly violated the terms of his placement by failing to report, the order was revoked. He was later brought to trial and ultimately imposed an aggregate sentence of 48 years incarceration. Number 2. Donald Green Serial domestic abuser Donald Green was arrested in May of 2017. After allegedly beating and strangling his wife inside their West Howard Street home in Muncie, Indiana, six months earlier, Delaware County had launched a domestic violence court aimed at processing such cases through the court system more expediently. A county prosecutor labeled Green as the poster child for the new initiative. His latest domestic incident reportedly centered around his wife's failure to bring him home a sandwich from the gas station. The perceived slight sent Green into a rage 
which was only exacerbated by his subsequent discovery that she'd thrown away his syringes earlier that day. Local authorities described how the man had repeatedly faced criminal charges in connection to his violent tendencies, but that most of the cases were eventually dismissed due to his alleged victim's unwillingness to testify against him. On July the 24th of 2017, Green finally faced punishment for his actions after he pleaded guilty to domestic battery, for which he was given a suspended one-year jail sentence. Number 1. Antoine Johnson Jr. At about 11 a.m. on May the 4th of 2022, Baltimore police were called to the 2400 block of Greenmount Avenue after receiving reports of a shooting. Upon their arrival, law enforcement encountered a gunshot victim, a 26-year-old male who was taken to the hospital in serious but stable condition. The perpetrator of the attack was identified as 30-year-old Antoine Johnson Jr., whom the police described as a repeat violent offender. Three years prior to the shooting, Johnson had reportedly been convicted of second-degree assault, which resulted in a sentence of 18 months probation. Before that, the man had served five years in prison in connection to convictions on charges of second-degree assault and a weapons offense. For his latest run-in with the law, Johnson was charged with attempted first-degree murder, attempted second-degree murder, first-degree assault, second-degree assault, reckless endangerment, and weapons violations. He was held in custody at Baltimore's Central Booking and Intake Center, pending the continuation of his case's legal proceedings. Thanks for watching. Would you rather owe money to the mob or to the government? Let us know in the comments section below.